of the South Pacific appeared idyllic. Each forming a remote tropical paradise far from the rest of civilization. But the Pacific is in crisis. In recent years, poor governments, economic mismanagement and health problems have plagued these island nations. And despite receiving more aid per person than anywhere in the world, Pacific countries are struggling to meet UN development goals. I'm Drew Ambrose, and on this edition of 101 East, we're in Tonga to ask what is the future of the islands in the South Pacific. In Tonga, known as the Friendly Islands, life appears carefree. But tradition remains important. Today in the capital, Nuku'alofa, the local boys' college is marking their 145th anniversary with a parade for all generations. Located between New Zealand and Hawaii, this isolated chain of 176 islands was never formally colonised. Up until 25 years ago, Tongans lived sustainably off the land and sea. At the Cultural Centre, health educator Paul Vavili is showing me how opening up to the world has led to some weighty problems here. Well, the photos actually tell the whole story about the changes in a way. And uh, as you can see from the photos, the, the people are generally relatively small compared to what you're seeing now. Uh, and of course, over the past uh, 50 or so years, we've seen enormous change in, in the uh, size of the Tongan people. The data that we have uh, is that in 1973, an average female weighed 73 kilos. 2004, this increased to 95 kilos. And for an average male, 79 kilos in 73, and in 2004, just under 96 kilos. So you've seen a dramatic increase in the average weight. So back then, these people were facing challenges like typhoid yes. and, and problems like that. And now, they're facing... A different challenge. A Probably a bigger challenge. The Free Wesleyan Church is holding their annual conference, a festival of faith and food. Feasting is a central part of Tongan life, with families joining together to eat big meals every Sunday and for important celebrations. Because just like the culture, the religion also plays a big part. And so people uh, see their, their preparation of food as their way of expressing how they feel for their God. <laughs> But overeating and a poor diet is contributing to an obesity epidemic here. According to the World Health Organization, 90% of Tongans are overweight, with 60% obese. The problem is, feasts are a typical meal. So over the next week, these church members will eat three meals a day, each prepared by a different congregation or village. They are showing some restraint. In previous years, they used to eat four meals a day. Eight of the ten fattest populations in the world are in the Pacific. Tonga weighs in at number four. Paul Vavili says providing bountiful food is a sign of respect, a culture hard to combat. If you have a guest coming to your house and, and you welcome them with some food, the more food that is presented, the more respect you're showing to this person. And so as a result, uh, more often people err towards giving more than giving less. Islanders who once subsisted on fish and vegetables are now eating imported processed food, high in salt, sugar and fat. Barbecue restaurants around town are open 24-7, selling greasy cutlets with little nutritional value. Of course, this is the bigger size, and this contains six pounds of corned beef. Fatty meats in cans on shelves and supermarket freezers is another peril. There's now a push here to have these meats banned or taxed. Cost is one of the main factors, and uh, you know it's easily available, it's relatively cheap, uh, and, and so people it's easy for them to open a can of beef and cook it. Often they can use it to feed 
quite a few people. And so in terms of distance, it does go a little while to feed the family. And one of the other important issues as well is the absence of a healthy alternative. And so if we can, for example, impose a, a tax or a duty on these products, make it more expensive, and perhaps use some of the uh, money that we get from that to subsidize a healthier alternative, so that making healthy choices, easier choices, becomes a reality. And I guess it's also difficult because Tongans, your average Tongan doesn't want the doctor to, I guess, interfere in, in what they eat. Yeah. Many of the Tongans think that uh, what I do with my life is my business. What happens when I'm sick is the doctor's business. But in Tonga, a doctor's business can be hard to stomach. Amputations and heart disease have risen to record levels. 80% of surgeries and a third of deaths are linked to lifestyle-related diseases. Fisherman I.C. Tuoanga lost one leg through diabetes caused by unhealthy eating. The 45-year-old's second foot is in bad shape. I'm concerned about my other leg. I want to take care of it because I don't want it to get cut off. By cutting it off, I can't do any work. Losing a limb doesn't just mean losing an income. Amputees here rarely live beyond a decade. Lifestyle-related diseases are a slow death sentence carrying social ramifications. It's a kind of a, a downhill spiral, you know, they, they will be more moribund, they, they won't be active anymore and uh, obviously their diabetes will not be well controlled. Um, they also become a burden to their, to their friends and relatives. Dr. Siali Akoola is Tonga's Director of Health, one of 50 doctors serving the country's overcrowded health system. Patients like this 19-year-old girl are symbolic of younger people presenting with lifestyle-related diseases, normally associated with the elderly. Here in Tonga, is obesity and lifestyle-related diseases causing a health crisis? Absolutely. I mean, uh, like I said, I mean, I think if you if you consider the reduction in life expectancy as a big issue, it is a crisis. The hospital clinic treats sepsis, missing toes, and foot ulcers every day. One in ten Tongans are diabetic. Some Pacific nations have rates of 40 percent. If the patient deteriorates, specialist health care for cancers and kidney failure are non-existent. Dialysis uh, gives you an extended lifespan. You know, people live for more than 15 years on dialysis. We do not have the resources to, to have any dialysis and all, everybody who has uh, any form of uh, renal impairment that ends up having uh, end-stage renal failure, uh, they will definitely die in Tonga. The hospital runs weekly exercise classes to encourage a healthy lifestyle. But in the dentistry department, an intriguing experiment is underway. Dr. Selilo Tomiki is trying to help two of his dental technicians lose weight. He has wired their jaws shut so they can only consume a liquid diet. The whole idea came about from uh, wiring one assistant, David, weighing in at 135 kilograms, has lost 11 kilograms already. Is there any danger to this? I mean, what if he vomits? What are, what that's, are the risks? That's, that's, that's one of the uh, dangers. If people uh, vomit, so we try to tell them that he can carry around a pair of scissors. If you want to vomit, he just snip the wire. Outsiders, I guess, would think it's, it's a bit of an extreme idea to yes, wire yes. someone's jaws shut. It is. It is, it is a... a a big idea, and I know a lot of people may say we are very cruel, but uh, 
to the weight. We have proved that he lost these 11 kilos in two weeks. Dr. Tomiki hopes his idea will be implemented nationwide, as wiring is far cheaper than lap band surgery and can be done in 10 minutes. If we coach them properly after removing the wire to see their weight, and then I think there's a reward for them. That they see their weight is down, the blood pressure is okay, and the sugar level is okay. They want to remain that way, so they will continue to follow the diet that they went through. Tonga is successfully meeting UN Millennium Goals that address education, children and sanitation in developing countries. They must meet eight benchmarks by 2015, but Tonga is failing on lifestyle-related diseases. We are on track for meeting other, other targets like maternal and child health, but certainly for non-communicable diseases, I, I don't think it is, uh, it is uh, realistic. Overseeing their progress is the UN Development Programme, who opened an office here in May. Its representative says the country's poor finances is holding development back. There is a concern with the ability to meet financially government's operational priorities. In saying that, it is realised that it's a, there's a concern as well with the rising of public debts. It's not just Tonga's health system that is struggling. The whole economy is in crisis, shouldering rising debt currently at $174 million. I think it's a, it's a model that can be used by other... Dependence on foreign aid is the main problem for the country's Prime Minister, Lord Tuivacano. From a small developing countries like, like Tonga, I think you, you cannot uh, do without the assistance of development partners. Um, because uh, we have a population of just over 100,000. So, and by doing that, I don't think you can uh, have a lot of money in order to do a real sustainable development. Tonga's health sector does receive government funding, but it's Japanese donors that are building new wards and facilities at the hospital. To put it simply, without aid, the Tonga health system cannot function. As with most developing countries, a lot of the health budget goes into salaries. And when you take away all the uh, obligatories that we have to spend, pharmaceuticals and utilities and all the rest of it, we, we end up with uh, less than one million for operating a Ministry of Health. Tonga's parliament has just started sitting. Today, they're debating the budget, which is surviving on loans from the World Bank. The country is at high risk of debt distress and one disaster away from financial collapse. Government officials claim it will take three generations to recover. Prime Minister Tui Vakano says his only options are slashing public sector jobs and privatising 13 state-owned businesses, half of which are making a loss. It's probably the age of them. Probably some of them will probably have to just to let go of them because I think it will just drain on, uh, on the resources of the, of the government. And, and some of them has not been working uh, so far and had not been bringing dividends into, into the government. China provided Tonga with a $60 million loan for reconstruction projects after riots in 2006 raised the capital to the ground. Tonga received another $42 million from China after the global economic crisis. They're almost impossible to repay. The Prime Minister hopes to win favour by voting with China in the UN or have the loans converted into grants. We're working on it, <laughs> but uh, we know it's a, it's a burden. But um, um, there are things, especially with the UN, um, how can we assist them in what way, especially within the, the, the international arena? Hesi Fanua is a political commentator who runs a local online news service and has worked on anti-corruption initiatives with Transparency International. He says Tonga's escalating debt could lead to a decline in government services, an exodus of skilled people and a withdrawal of international funds. This is the first time this year that we will actually will really feel the pinch. 
in the next, I think the next two years is going to get worse. I think it's so bad that, that we had been warned that we no longer can borrow from the World Bank. And I presume the Asian Development Bank will be the same for the few years, next few years. And I think that's, uh, that, that, that's how bad it is. Tonga still has an abundance of natural resources. Pessy says people will once more have to rely on land and sea if the country plummets into financial collapse. Realistically, you can live here without a penny in your pocket. You can grow your food, build your house and all that. So that's a safety valve in, in that respect. You may not have a job, but of course, if the government is gone bankrupt, then maybe you don't have the, uh, the, the, the health service, then you don't uh, have, get the road fixed, and it won't take very long before everything just fall apart. Tonga is one of four Pacific countries to have serious pressures on its national budget. Part of the problem is this region is unable to exploit the full potential of its commercial sectors, like agriculture. This problem can be seen firsthand, far from the capital, on Tonga's remote outer islands. Subsistence farming is common here. Using an underground oven, Latu Leha is preparing lunch with vegetables she grew on her family's land. But she says when it comes to using the land for profit, men make those decisions. I think it's hard because sometimes I've done, I think the men in here depend on the ladies. They think uh, they just growing a little crops only their own need of their family. They didn't think of other way of growing crops to take it to overseas or other countries to sell it out over there. Because uh, most in here is uh, only the women's the, um, family depends on women's. Land is underutilised around Foa, her home island. Lasu says acquiring more land is a lengthy, costly legal process, and the island's isolation makes commercial growing unprofitable. But she thinks her village could make better use of their individual plots by working together. I would like the community, maybe uh, women and uh, men, to help me uh, in order to make more vegetable gardens just, um, to look forward to help the, not only for my family but for all the whole com community. Land use is another challenge for the Prime Minister. I know there's a lot of FCD landowners, especially because a lot has migrated from the outer islands into the to, to the main island. So a lot has been left, like in the, in the other islands, uncultivated. And, and so the government in the, has been trying to, to see what they can do in order to solve that problem. But it's not an easy road for those who farm for commercial profit. Despite its fertile soils and ideal subtropical climate, Tonga is a net food importer. Farmers have been hurt by high petrol prices, irregular shipping routes, and have invested their energies in the wrong crops. I think everybody's representing. I mean, you've got it needs to be a national strategy in terms of what crops should we doing and, and focus. So it's, it's structurally diverse. You, you need a minimum of four product lines. One crop grown here, watermelons, are bulky and have a low shelf life, making them hard to export over long distances. The tyranny of distance is a term that's been thrown around in terms of um, the Pacific economies. Um, right now I'd say that the main challenge that we have for watermelon would be the, the logistics. I mean, we're down to shipping. We've only got a, a, we've only got a fortnightly shipping service, which doesn't make watermelon viable. What it means is that only 50% of a crop will be exported because, I mean, once you miss that cycle, you know, the, the other half won't go. Um, but having said that, it's always chicken and egg. You not, you're not able to establish a weekly service which will make a lot of crops viable unless you, you develop the volumes to the level. So um, industry is actually working on that now. We're talking about that with the shipping companies and with government. Um, but everybody needs to be doing their part. While the Pacific seems stranded, hope is on the horizon in towns, farms and factories across the ocean.
These Pacific Islanders have travelled 2,000 kilometres to work here in rural New Zealand in a program where they send remittances home. Hold on, boys. Such worker schemes have become more viable as communication and transport costs have dropped. The key thing as well, nowhere in the Pacific is, is big enough that there's an urban centre where you're going to ever have highly skilled, high wage employment available. Whereas on the outside of the Pacific, Auckland, Sydney, Brisbane, San Francisco, you've got cities that are short of labour and where the, the wages are so much higher. So allowing the free, free movement of people from the Pacific out to those rim cities and the, the free and the low cost sending of money and resources back is actually not a bad solution. 50% of Tonga's population work overseas. <laughs> Safita Hauli manages 1,000 Tongan remittance workers. They earn $20 an hour here, compared with just $2 at home. I don't think it's the best way, but this is the best way today, given the situation that we find ourselves in. Long-term employment in the Pacific, and I'm talking about all the Pacific countries, is never a guarantee. Whereas over here, you're more likely to be guaranteed to come back every season and earn, if not the same, probably better as you become more skilled. Safita believes Tonga can learn a lot from businesses here and need to harness better workplace skills at home. We have to ask ourselves, why is it that we have productive workers who are appreciated outside of Tonga? What is it that we as a country can do to make them as productive for Tonga and the government I think needs to look very closely at how that can be done. Young Tongans are well educated but there are a few jobs at home. Remittances represent an opportunity to work abroad. But critics of remittances say too many Tongans depend on their relatives overseas and are too lazy to earn their own living. For people having problems, instead of going down and grow their own things, it's easier for them to pick up the phone and ring up their son or their daughters overseas and do a little cry. And of course people will, will help, right? Uh, that's the reality and it's not healthy and it's not good. But by sending money directly to rural communities, remittances can be more effective than aid. One of the big differences, say, between remittances and, and aid is, you know, the remittances are being directed where the, um, where the migrants think it's, it's best needed or where their families, so they may send it to their families who then apply it to, you know, to churches, to microfinance or community schemes or what have you. Whereas with, with aid, it's typically flowing through governments or through NGOs. Remittances allow villagers to maintain their traditional life and important extended family connections. Latu Leha says money sent from overseas helps with school, transportation and family expenses. Overseas money uh, brings us more money in here and it helps the community to have a, a quick development. But if we we doing our own in here to get money is uh, slow down our, our community. A third of Tonga's GDP relies on remittances, but they've slowed down since the global financial crisis, affecting Latu's village and communities nationwide. It is a, it is a, a risky business to depend on remittance. It has affected a lot of families now because a lot of them have depend on it. Tonga and other South Pacific countries are only just keeping their heads above water on an ocean that stretches across a third of the earth. Communities are a pillar of strength against formidable challenges, health, governance and economic stability. For these small island nations to prosper, they'll need not only faith, but a willingness to adapt to a changing world.